Hello everyone. Today we'll be talking about how to manage hypoxemic patient in ICU. And in this lecture, we'll discuss about how to keep SATs more than 90%. In the previous lecture, we understood how to figure out what the underlying cause for your hypoxemia is. In this, we'll try to maintain the oxygen SATs between 90 to 92% till their underlying cause is corrected. The first step to maintain the SATs is increasing your FiO2. Most of the diseases cause hypoxemia, usually by decreasing surface area or worsening vacuum matching. So you have a couple of ways to improve both of these. These include PEEP, recruitment maneuvers, proning, positioning, and inhaled nitric oxide. Since these patients have no reserves, you want to use oxygen for the most important organs. And therefore, you want to decrease the oxygen consumption by tissues like muscles. So you want to decrease your work of breathing and optimize respiratory mechanics. And this can be done by reducing resistive work of breathing, reducing ventilator patient asynchrony, sedation, and paralytic. If you are unable to achieve oxygenation by any of these means, you have to look for VV ECMO. Maintaining SATs 90 to 92% is more important than worrying about oxygen-induced lung injury. So increase your FIO2 to 100%. Usual target of your SATs is 90 to 92%. However, some doctors will even tolerate SATs up to 88%. SATs below 88% have not been studied very well in literature. Most common diseases such as ARDS and pneumonia cause hypoxemia by shunt physiology. However, we have learned before that VQ scatter is possibly more common cause than a pure shunt. Even though the shunt don't respond very well to oxygen, there is some improvement in PO2 with increasing FiO2 and this might be sufficient for your patient to linger on while you're treating his underlying condition. Make sure that you maintain your SATs between 90 to 92% using appropriate FiO2. SATs lower than 88% may result in tissue injury while SATs more than 92% may result in undue side effect of high oxygen therapy. Next step is to reduce resistive work of breathing if present and the most important thing to notice in this case is secretion. Secretions are pretty common in ICU. With the endotracheal tube, you have to make sure that you section the patient regularly and keep a close eye on the quantity and quality of secretions. Watch for tube blocks and lower collapses. Make sure that you section the endotracheal tube yourself daily. Step three, reduce ventilator asynchrony. Ventilator asynchrony increases oxygen consumption and worsens the lung injury. Vent asynchrony is at another lecture by itself. We'll talk about this in another lecture. Next step, reduce agitation. Reducing agitation is very important. Agitation results in patient vent asynchrony and increased oxygen consumption by non-essential tissues like muscles, which can, in these circumstances, consume up to 30 to 40 percent of your oxygen that is being absorbed. So figure out why your patient is agitated. There are various causes apart from pain and discomfort. So make sure that you are looking to make the patient comfortable, but don't miss out on other causes of agitation. Delirium prevention strategies in ICU patients are important. We'll talk about this in some other lecture as well. Next step is to optimize PEEP. PEEP can help recruit, improve VQ matching, help oxygenation, and improves the LV function. However, at certain point, it's going to start reducing the cardiac output and increase the dead space ventilation. So whenever you see somebody who is hypoxemic, don't randomly increase the PEEP by two. I would suggest you watch my lecture on how to optimize PEEP. This will give you an idea how to use these numbers to best help improve recruitment, VQ matching while not running into complications. PEEP works by reducing atelectasis, preventing atelect trauma. It increases the surface area by recruitment. It can counter auto PEEP and decrease work of breathing. It can improve left ventricle function and decrease pulmonary edema and decrease right to left shunt. However, it can decrease the right ventricle function, decrease venous return and increase dead space ventilation apart from causing barotrauma. Recruitment maneuvers are often useful in patients who are hypoxemic. They're associated with improved oxygenation and less frequent requirement for rescue therapy. However, they do run a risk of barotrauma and hemodynamic compromise Though in a recent meta-analysis, this was shown to be non-significant. 
However, these two conditions need to be monitored very carefully when you are doing a recruitment maneuver. So at this point of time, there's insufficient evidence for routine use, but whenever your patient is in trouble, like in this case, go ahead and you can use a recruitment maneuver. Most of the literature would use 40 centimeter of PEEP for 40 seconds as the recruitment maneuver. However, this can cause severe hemodynamic compromise in certain patients. So it might be prudent to start at 20 for 20 seconds. And if patient tolerates, you can go up to 40 by 40 seconds. Make sure that once the recruitment maneuver is performed, the PEEP that you return to is on the higher side of the optimal PEEP for the best results. Some physicians will like to bag the patient in these circumstances. One of the problem that you are running is you do not know how much volume or PEEP your patient is getting. So your rate of barotrauma and hemodynamic compromise may be higher. Proning is the simplest thing that you can do to improve oxygenation and prevent mortality. You can do other simple measures like head of bed elevation, avoid wedging of the patient to help your VQ matching. As we discussed before, try to position patient such that shunt is in west lung zone 1 and good lung is in west lung zone 3. We'll discuss more detail about proning and how it works in some other lecture, but it's important to understand that in moderate to severe ARDS with PF ratio less than 150, proning has shown to be really useful. This was the Proceva study which showed hazard ratio of 0.39 with respect to mortality when you compared prone and supine group. Contraindication of proning include spinal instability, unstable fractures, anterior burns, pregnancy, and raised ICP. Next step is using a paralytic. Paralytics are very useful and they reduce patient ventilator asynchrony, especially when your patient is on very low tidal volumes. And therefore, this is used mostly in patient with very severe ARDS. They also take away all the work of breathing. You can also use paralytic if you observe that the patient has increased respiratory drive that could potentially generate large transpulmonary pressures so as to cause more lung injury in these patients. However, no mortality benefit has been shown in moderate to severe ARDS by use of a paralytic. Two trials have been done so far. One was Acuris's study back in 2010, which showed that there was improved outcome when you use the paralytic when compared to a placebo. However, a subsequent larger study has shown that there was no significant difference between paralytic and a control group. Pulmonary vasodilators like inhaled nitric and inhaled folin can selectively vasodilate well-ventilated lung units and can improve VQ mismatch. They also re help reduce vascular resistance and pulmonary hypertension. For example, we have an alveoli with good ventilation but poor perfusion. If you give this alveoli inhaled nitric, there are chances that the perfusion to this area is going to increase and this alveoli can participate in oxygen exchange, therefore improving your VQ mismatch. However, there is insufficient evidence at this point of time to recommend their routine use. They do result in transient improvement in oxygenation but do not reduce mortality. However, the studies that have been done using inhaled nitric and inhaled flowland, they are pretty small, so a larger trial is still awaited. Finally, if nothing works, VV ECMO is the last straw. VV ECMO provides oxygenation till the primary etiology for hypoxemic respiratory failure resolves. So it's imperative that you understand what the underlying problem is. There are two randomized controlled trials that has been done. The first randomized control trial was seizure trial done in 2009, which showed significant improvement in survival. However, a subsequent trial, EOLIA trial, was unable to show any difference between mortality between ECMO and control group. However, the study design was a little flawed because there were 28% of patients who crossed over from control group to ECMO group, and these were much severe and appeared later in the disease process. So patient selection is the key in choosing VV ECMO. Make sure that you initiate early within seven days and you have used all the methods as we talked about to improve the oxygenation. Contraindication include severe neurological injury and end stage cancer. ECMO is not free of complication. It can result in bleeding in 30 to 50% of the patient and can be fatal in 5%. Other complications include thromboembolism, DVT, strokes, and cannulation related problems. To summarize, 
Whenever you are called to see a hypoxemic patient, you have to perform two steps. First, figure out what's causing the hypoxemia. And second, maintain the oxygen sats 90 to 92%. Please see my previous lecture to figure out how to work up for hypoxemia. To maintain the sats, you have to follow these 10 step protocol. Increase the FIO2 and target your sats to 90 to 92%. Reduce resistive work of breathing. That means manage secretions and bronchospasm. Reduce ventilator asynchrony. Choose appropriate sedation. Make sure your patient is not agitated. Try to figure out optimal PEEP for your patient. Excessive PEEP and under PEEP both are not helpful for your patients. You can perform recruitment maneuvers if you have recruitable lungs. You should prone your patient if their PF ratio is less than 150. You can attempt various positions to keep your good lung in West Lung Zone 3 and bad lung in West Lung Zone 1. Use paralytic if you see a lot of wind asynchrony and excessive transpulmonary pressures. You can choose to use inhaled pulmonary vasodilators like nitric oxide and inhaled flolan. If everything fails, evaluate for VV ECMO. Hopefully by now you should be able to have some good idea about how to evaluate and manage your hypoxemic patient. Thank you.